My name is Michael Long. I'm uh, currently an iOS developer for Client Resources, a consulting company here in Omaha. A um, bit of background, this is why I skipped that part, since I already had it in the slide. I've been doing uh, software, I did software for many computers and mainframes, I've done Mac application development, I've done Windows application development, I've done e-commerce and internet development over the past 12 years. Um, I have a background in quite a few languages and technologies. I'm pretty heavy with uh, uh, object-oriented software, uh, Objective-C, C++, Java, Object Pascal, um, going all the way back to Smalltalk, if anybody ever got into Smalltalk. Um, lots of procedural stuff, some eyeball things like Lisp and Forth, and lots and lots of assembly languages. And I've been doing a layer called Fusion Development since June 1977 with version 3.0. So I don't know if we're contemporaries there in that point. I started in 4.5. Hmm. Um, incidentally, the space was deleted in 3, uh, CF4, I think. And I've been doing object-oriented cold fusion development since version 3.1. And uh, that might be something we can talk about a little bit later. But this is about Data Forms 3, and Data Forms 3 is an object-based form generator and processor. And basically that means that you take a form definition and it will generate all of the form code needed to display the form and validate, handle, and process the results. And why do I want to do that? Because I'm lazy. Um, I really hate writing boilerplate code and I like leaving things uh, to the computers that computers can do better than I can and they can make sure that everything's spelled correctly all the time, and they can make sure that all the little details are handled, and if they can do it, I don't want to. So that gets us down into um, traditional HTML forms. So, so I'm gonna go back through some of the ways that we did forms and just sort of talk about the problems that I was trying to solve with doing this. Um, if you're using Cold Fusion, you want to do a traditional HTML form. You've all done traditional HTML forms. Um, pretty much you kind of have to write the CF param for the defaults and everything to make sure that you've got fields to work with. You have to marshal your data. You have to move it to and from your data source, wherever that is. Um, get it from the SQL database and write it back out or something. You have to make labels for all the fields. You have to create layouts for all the fields. You have to put them in tables or divs or put them in some sort of structure so it looks good. Um, you have to write all the input statements. You have to do, um, if you do a select list, you know, you have to say, this is the one that's been selected, and if it comes back in with an error, then you have to go find the one that's been selected again, and so on and so forth. Um, radio button groups, you have to do server-side validation to make sure that what the guy submitted is what you actually want. Um, and even that's not even getting to the client-side code. So there's a whole lot of things you have to do just the handle the form. It's, it's not specifying the information, it's just boilerplate code. Um, now Adobe, well, actually Macromedia tried to fix this a little bit with CF forms, and CF forms was kind of, you know, well, we're gonna write some stuff to help you do forms, right? Well, it does help a little bit, but you still have to write a CF param for every field. You still have to marshal the data in and out of the form. You still have to make the labels. You still have to create the structure. Uh, you still have to do the input statements and the CF select statements, although CF select does help with the options now. Um, you still need to do, specify the server-side validation code, um, and it will sort of kind of write some client-side validation code for you. Um, but in terms of error presentation and feedback and so on, it kind of sucked. I mean, you know, everybody really wants to see the thing where you submit a form and you get the list of errors that you didn't have to go back to and say, go back and fix that for me, will you? Just um, 
Then they had the brilliant idea of doing flash forms. And with flash forms, you still need to be able to get data in and out of the form. Uh, it had better client-side handling, but you still needed a level of server-side validation just in case, in case somebody tried to bypass your, your form. Um, you had some issues with download speed, with getting all of the, the form down. You have UI and UX problems with the way the form looks and or handles doesn't quite match the platform that you're on. And uh, that still leaves issues when you have uh, flash plugins that might be disabled or in some cases not supported at all, depending on your platform. Now they've been doing a lot of work recently and there's probably seen some articles and I think even the last meeting they had we talked a little bit about um, maybe not using cold fusion so much and using more JavaScript things for client-side UX. So, you know, using jQuery validation, using jQuery forms, using, uh, you know, the various grid options and so on, and maybe letting cold fusion do the server back end things. Um, but even if you want to try doing, like using jQuery validation, on an HTML form, you're still back to the point where you still have to get your params to make sure you've got data to work with, you still have to marshal, uh, you still have to create the late, you still have to create the structure, right? You still have to do all the work to create a form. Uh, in short, that's better, it gives you a better experience on the user side, but you still need server side validation because the scripts may not always be running. Which brings me to data forms. Uh, with data forms, the CF params aren't needed. Um, the object ORM, o -R -M, I'll work in my vowels there, data marshaling is handled for you. The labels are handled for you, the layout's generated for you, the input fields are generated for you, the select statement and management's generated for you, uh, radios and checkboxes are handled correctly, server-side validation and error messages are handled, and it will create um, client-side validation for you as well. Um, now, it's not magic. You kind of still need to provide some sort of form specification. You still need to do your validation criteria, and in some cases, you still need to handle special options. Uh, but that's sort of it. Um, the data forms components that I've made are, well, they're components. They require CF8 or better, um, so you really can't use them on older platforms. And you do need jQuery and jQuery validation for the client-side processing. If you don't want to do client-side processing, just do server-side error checking, then you don't need to include those, but it'll work with both. This is the third generation of this, um, and I might go into that a little bit later, but um, the, the second one I've been using for lots and lots and lots and lots of clients. Um, and it was kind of an XML-based form specification. So you defined your form in XML and it would generate all the pieces and parts for you. So code. way to do this. Well, I had all of the It looks like it lost my stuff there, folks. So hold on one second. Uh. <clears throat> okay, so let's, where am I, there we go. So this is basically a form that was generated by data forms. And it is, I mean, it's a simple sample form. 
Uh, and it's doing um, jQuery validation inside. But if you, all the stuff that we looked at that you were doing to handle the forms, this is pretty much it. Uh, on line five, it creates a new form. On line seven, it creates a hidden ID. And you use that a lot of times when obviously you want to load in an existing record or handle uh, user parameters. <clears throat> Just as a test, I created a hidden value that says my name is Mike Long. <clears throat> this version of it is script-based. In other words, there's a object and you're calling methods on the object to create the form. Prior version was XML based. The XML based version was kind of neat, but when you started needing to do conditional things, then you had to start writing cold fusion code to try to, to tell it what parts of the XML to include. There was this whole craze for a while in that um, everybody decided that the best way to handle object based languages was to do all your uh, specifications and configuration and whatnot outside of the language in yet another, another language that didn't have the same control and whatnot as your language did, XML. So this was, I'm circling back around to doing it in code because in code you can do conditionals, you can do all sorts of fun things that can't do in XML. Um, so basically I tried to make it look as similar as I could to the same names, the same parameters. Um, since these are being passed as parameters to this object, the only thing that I couldn't really get around was you have to separate the parameters with commas. But there's an input label, full name, input label, email address, input label, URL, city state, buttons, submit button. Um, Now, this is just doing class as required, class required email, and so on. This first sample is really just a version that's not even using a back-end data source. It was just trying to see if I could get this stuff working with jQuery validation. And jQuery validation wanted you to pass all your validation rules as classes, as CSS classes. So that's where you see this is required this is a required email and so on. So this little set generated this form. Now for a slightly better one, so first name, last name, email address, gender, radio buttons, select boxes, notes, so on, uh, CSS required, why not? Now this is actually working with a data source, so um, it's creating a new uh, ORM object for a member. It's creating the same form. Um, if member is object new, then I want a new member record, otherwise I want to say, you know, this is member so-and-so. A slightly different syntax where I'm doing um, Every one of the objects returns the form object as a result. So you can do what you sort of do in JavaScript a lot of times where you can chain your definitions together and not have to say my form dot field set, my form dot input, my form dot label. So you can embed HTML in it. You can create your own custom labels. Um, Inline means that I want these things to be in the same line as opposed to on a new row each time. Uh, a select with options, HTML, and so on. But other than the form definition, and also I think you see the validation, so again it's uh, validate required email, validate required last name, and so on. Starting with 
that all strung all together as one long uh, object notation? Is that the idea? You can, you can do it two ways. You can say, yeah, but every time you call one of those methods, it returns the form as the result. Yep. Function dot HTML, and then it goes for a while, and then it has another dot HTML, and then a dot label, and then a dot input, all without a semicolon. That's all right. That's all object call. Well, actually, it's a method call, and then a method call, and then a method call, and then a method call on the same object. Within the same object, but I'm saying it's not syntactically. I'm used to saying more like this, where I have a line and a semicolon, and I have some complex object. That's a really, really complex object. It's got a lot of lines in it. You know, it's a single inline call. If you strung it out on a, on a one line, it would be really long, right? It would. Yeah. So but but you see that a lot um, in JavaScript when you're doing uh, Node and Angular and whatnot, where <coughs> the objects keep returning references to themselves. Yeah. So you don't have to do what you're doing here and well, say, you my. To. but you can. Yeah. And this is syntactics. So what, my I, I was, but also the fact that... I mean, is there a performance gain? Is it, it certainly isn't more readable. Is there some kind of performance gain or...? or there's, um, it's returning the same thing, so you're doing the same call, so not really. Okay. Um, there's less code. Like fewer semicolons. Fewer semicolons, well, there's fewer my, my uh, form dot whatevers. Um, but also in these guys, they kind of need to be chained anyway because if I want these things in the same line, I need to be able to say that they're in line. Gotcha. So if I can do it there, I just do it elsewhere. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we saw all the fields that are here, first name, last name, email, gender, education, so on, which are specified in the form but everything is sort of done when you come down through it. So if my form process, that function call will look to see if the form has been submitted. If the form has been submitted, it will gather up all the values. It will validate all the values. It will generate error messages and return that if needed. If it succeeds, then basically you can just fall through and say member.save because it will also look at the object you passed and call all the getters and the setters on that object and marshal the data in and out of the form for you. So this is the server-side processing part of it? Basically. That's the server-side part. Gotcha. But the display line down here that you see, uh, myform.display, is taking the form definition, generating all the HTML, generating all the labels, generating uh, via some calls to JavaScript and whatnot, all of the, the client-side JavaScript code as well. So that's why when it's doing this, it's not doing a server-side submit. Gotcha. Cool. Cool. Is this long code? Three words code? Uh, it's, it will be. I just haven't, I haven't put it up yet. There's still a few things I was kind of working on. Um, now, I talked a bit before about one of the things when you're doing these kind of structures, you're always having to create your own layout. And this is entirely CSS based. So if you'd prefer like a different layout, just change the CSS and generate a different layout. Um, so those are doing divs and just obviously trading different divs on the labels and so on. <clears throat> One of the features that I have in the works for it, um, the actual section of code that does the generation is actually fairly small. And so there was going to be little plugins I was going to make for it. So if you wanted to do um, 
have it generate the syntax that Bootstrap wants. You could do Bootstrap generation, or you could do uh, HTML5 form generation, or whatever your, your process wants to be there. Uh, my little window's in the way there, I'm just to go away. Um, you can also, I mean, do fairly complex and large forms. So there's a version of this that's actually been used in a client's uh, project. So they wanted to do evaluations and building assessments and so on. So again, you've got a bit of code to handle these things, but you'd have a bit of code to handle it anyway. What you don't have are um, all the finicky code where you're saying, you know, go get this field and stuff it in here and go get this field out of the form and put it back into the object and I'll go save the object. Again, it's doing all the marshalling. And you're doing that by convention? Yeah, standard getters and setters. So how does it know, how does it know to map the first name to the, to the object? <coughs> it's, 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 if you say field name equals first name. Oh, it, that's the column name. That's, well, that can either be a column name or it can be a getter or setter. I say getter in that case. Oh, okay. So it will look, it will, it will do um, introspection on the object and look to see if it's got a get first name. And if it does, it calls it. If it doesn't, it'll look to see if it's got a property like that. And if it does, it'll call it. Um, if it's struct, it'll look to see if it's got a member like of that name. If it does, it'll call it and use it. This is a, um, so again, inline editing or inline uh, validation, but still not a valid email address. E so this has a stub in it that um, basically, in that case, you give it a URL and um, it will serialize it and post it off to an endpoint as, an in, as a built-in AJAX call. And it will take whatever is the result and display it back. So the AJAX is baked into your, your object? I see. What for, I mean, how do you, I guess you have to make sure you... Um, it, it, it's, in this particular case, it's handling it as a standard post. Um, but again, there's, um, there's a method that it depends on to do that, yeah, yeah. but I was going to stub that out and just have it, you know, you could make a different component for depending how you want to handle it. Yeah. Well, six. So this is one, I mean, you've seen this form before, but the difference here is that on the web page itself, this is all that's on that web page. So it's getting uh, a new member, it's getting an instantiating a component form, it's saying if process it with this object, if that succeeded, save it, I've got a new member. So the form definition has been moved into a component that extends object form. And so instead of putting all your code on the page, you can instantiate that into a component and then reuse the same component on lots of different pages. So like if you have to do a registration block for landing pages, you can just grab it, say display it, and then it'll do it. All right, so here it says make me a new object, a new form, 
pass it in the action, pass it in the styles, um, which can be passed in, or you can just bake it into the form itself. Uh, it's just options. And then process, marshal in, marshal out, display it. Again, with jQuery validation and all the other fun stuff. So it uses one style sheet. Um, like I said, it does use jQuery and jQuery validate if you're doing client-side validation. If you're not doing client-side validation, you can pull that out and you'll basically Let's see if I can get this one working. So you can see I tried to do a post on that, and now it's coming back with all the errors on server-side validation. Isn't that throwing a ton of errors on your console? Pardon? Um, no, because the way jQuery validation looks is that it's got the one script where it tries to go out and find the hooks. Oh, you can class engine. Gotcha. So it only tries to hook that up in the, on the back end if it's there, and if it's not there, it won't hook it up. So there's no scripts to be generated, really. Um, now, it will try to do the the the... the some of the custom validation scripts that you put in, but they'll never be connected because validate was never connected, so. Yeah. I, I forgot how it works. I don't remember. Um. So that's submitted, and this is a dump of the object. You can sort of kind of see the properties down there. Mic, long, notes high, and so on. So that, that one little line of code took that, marshaled into the object, saved it out, created a new record. It was done with. This? I hook that. That's the one call. Sometimes I disable that code. Um, okay, so those are just switches in the code that you've changed while you're on stage. Yeah, basically, if I want to kill the the client side processing and have it do the server side processing. I just kill, I just comment out the one line. Okay. But other than that, there's uh, not much more to that than that. The actual code generation is handled in two objects. One is um, a form object, and you can sort of see that when you called field set or when you called hidden or when you called input, it's basically taking the parameters you passed and building some structures out of that so it knows what to do for error handling and so that it knows what to do for code generation. And this is just boilerplate. This, you don't have to code, or is this the actual code? That's, that's the actual object that's doing. Yeah, so that's your. That's, that's the back end side of it. So all you did was just. Like I said, you just do the form definition. So you would just drop this into your server and then do the stuff you're doing on the front page and it would just work. Um, there's, and it can, and depending how you want to handle valid, you know, there's options in for handling the validation. Sometimes you like to see like a little list at the top of the form, you know, please enter your first name, please enter a valid email, so on. Or you can drop those out and just have it do the inline, what you saw before, where it said, you know, this field's required underneath it and highlight the CSS. Um, it generates a set of CSS styles around the form 
so that it knows to do like display this in red if it's an error or display this if it's a warning or so on. Um, there's about 940 line ones like lines of code that was doing all of the stuff that you just saw. I'm sorry? If you would just scroll down to one of your other methods. Like you have sys.flag auto, whatever. Um, when you return it, how are you how are you accessing that that sys um, variable that you're setting? I've never really done that before. You mean like this? Yeah, so you have sys append tag, we assume that's a custom method you have somewhere. Right, that's another method inside the, the component. Oh, so this relates back to the component itself. Yeah, it, it's basically an object. It's base, it, um, some people like to use you know, variables dot in their components. I did, I did it this way um, while I was developing it just so I can look inside the object to see what it's doing. So I can see the structures and so on. So, so this is not a keyword, it's a variable? Right? No, it's a keyword. Related back to the, to the parent object. Apparently. It's just that anything, anything that is in that component in this scope is visible outside of the object. Anything in that, in, in that component that's in variable scope is private to that object. Yeah, it's cold fusion. That's it's what? It's part of cold fusion's well, keyword. Yep. And local. But you can access it outside of it just automatically. Well, if if you if you create a component, you have a reference to it, right? What's that? If you create a component, you have a reference to it. Yeah. X equals new whatever, right? right. X is now a reference to the component. If you're inside the component, this is the reference to the component. So you can do x, y, z dot whatever you have assigned to this, whether it be a method or a, or a variable. Yeah. So basically, when I say return this, I'm returning yet another reference to the component, to anyone who's using that result. Basically, that's what's doing that daisy chain thing that we were talking about before. Oh. Well, anything that does... It's, it's working because you're returning this. It's, it's doing it because I'm returning this. I mean, That's how we basically in cold feet, you know, you, you, you're calling a method to an object. Yeah, reference. That's pretty cool. I, I'm just yeah, very I'm common to see. Um, if, it, like I said, it's, it's, if you get into like Node. Well, in cold feet, I mean. Yeah, but in cold fusion you don't. But in, in others you kind of do. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that part. I said it's been pounded into our heads as cold fusion developers not to use the zip scope outside of a special case of an application. Yeah, but it, it, it's, I think developing it kind of was a special case. Mm -hmm. I mean, one global search and replace and it's variables. But then your, your chaining would still work? Yeah. I mean, everything is, like all the configuration, like if you want auto inlines or auto labels, um, those are all just method calls on it too, so you're not reaching in to grab properties or anything on it.
I, it depends which versions I reach back to because that was a relatively new addition to one of the versions. Oh, yeah, if you're using 8, I think you said you supported 8. Yeah. I wonder if 8 is going to... It's very limited. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it was like 9, you could start doing the entire yeah. components in a script. But <laughs> as entire as you can get, right? And that's also why I tried doing, I tried minimizing my calls to do like, you know, some of the newer script generation, you know, the, the shorthand syntaxes for creating structs and whatnot. Just so I was trying to maintain as much backward compatibility as I could. And you haven't tried this on Rivals? Uh, no. But I'm not doing anything. Yeah, I would think, I mean, if you're supporting eight, I would think you'd be able to stop supporting eight. I think that's, that's, that's gone now, that's what, as of now? End of life, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, end of, I think end, end of life is like either last month or this one. For long-term support. Oh, that's what you're talking about. So there's a few things, I mean, you can sort of see where, you know, here's the code that you use to start a new row, here's the code you use to stop a new row. So writing new code generators, if you would rather use, you know, p tags, or if you need to do something different for, uh, like I said, for boilerplate base camp. No. Bootstrap. Pardon? Uh, setting that outside of yeah, I was gonna actually I was gonna just create a little generator component. So instead of having them call methods on the class, it would have the generator as part of the class, it would just call methods on the generator. So it can instantiate whichever one whichever set that it wanted. Um, there's parts of it down where I'm looking to open up some things. Trying not to make people dizzy. Anyway, there's a block in there somewhere where it's got a, a big set of uh, validation rules that it knows about. So I was also going to set up a way so you could add your own validation rules, uh, add your own CSS or uh, JavaScript rules to it for the client side. Um, you know, add more access points so that if you needed to. Dan, if, it, if you needed to do something and have it dynamically fill in a list, it could do it. Um, and it also, now this is the basic form part. There's just a little layer on top of this that's handling the object marshalling. So if I have an object, process if I have an object set it, um, how to get the default values out of an object, how to set the object values, call the getters, call the setters, and so on. So if, if, there, were, if there was a different ORM, if there was a different kind of bean or something like that you were using, um, it's pretty easy to put a different layer on top of the, on the data part. Um, the default version, the very, very, very first one you saw, was the core part, and it wasn't even using objects. It was just maintaining its own store. Orn. Orn. Gonna get my spelling now. I think they're ornery. Um. So. One thing that it didn't show, but the, if you go look at it, at the code that it generates, like if, when it generates the label, you know, every field has its own ID that's generated, every label has its own ID that's generated, every label has its own for this item that was generated. Um, so it's handling a lot of the syntax things that it's just a really pain in the butt to have to do yourself. 
and since it's using its own labels and so on, it's going to get it right. You know, it's not going to be misspelled here and misspelled there and, and chasing down something to do it a misspelled ID or syntax. Um, it also knows about, you know, the correct way to work with, say, text areas. So everything that will put into a text area will always be HTML edit formatted or handled correctly so that it's not going to blow the syntax out of it. When 11 appears around, I might have to look at that. Yeah, it's kind of, it just, it's all good. So it handles implementation issues, and so you can focus on the problem. Um, like I said, I want to do custom rules for jQuery validation. Um, it is handling select lists that are being passed to it. It really needs to be able to reach out to other objects for endpoints for select lists, like for lists of states or cities or something. Um, the versions prior to this that I've been using, they know about a dispatcher that I have globally in most of my applications. So I can say, you know, uh, display this query from this object and it knows how to go out and find it and, and instantiate it and get the query out of it and display everything in the list and whatnot. Uh, more form styles and examples, you know, I sort of had the one color in there, but you saw just by flipping a bit of the CSS how you could change the styles. Um, more code generators, like I said, bootstrap. And then, of course, there's more documentation, as in any documentation. Any questions? Uh, what do you think? I think if it's on GitHub, you might get some help. Yeah. Whether you can ask for it or not. And the nice thing about it is you can dig through if you want to see the new stuff. Well, I mean, this is something. Um, part of the reason I wanted, wanted to show this was not so much that it was going to be an open source project and I was wanting to get support for it. I think part of it was just that. Um, I thought this was an interesting way of solving some of these problems and some of the methodologies that I wanted to get around. Um, like I said, when I write code, you know, I've got problems that I want to solve. Users, clients pay you to do stuff, and you know, they don't pay you to write 15 CF prams. I mean, they do, but they shouldn't. And frankly, that's boring. So there's just things like that I wanted to eliminate, and I wanted to make it better. And um, I mean, I even have some of these things down to the point where I could show you, I have generator code that will generate the generator code. It will go look at it, one of my object definitions and generate all that form code for me so I can just go in and throw out the stuff I don't want to put on a screen and put that up. And so it, it does introspection and says, oh, this is a number, so he's going to want to number validate that. And the max length on this is 32 characters, so make sure we spend a max length there, and so on. So again, it's doing things quick and doing it as accurately as I can. And you know, computers are supposed to be able to handle the details. So that's what I kind of want them to do as much as possible. Um, I don't know if anybody is interested in this or not. I just thought it was something that was kind of slick. I mentioned before that I was doing objects all the way back in 3.1, but people probably know that components didn't show up until much, much, much later. Does anybody want to see how I did objects in 3.1? Um, 
do, do people know how pretty much how object-oriented languages work? I mean, internally? Okay, you've got, when well, you've got objects, right? You've got a class, usually. In most languages, you have a class. You specify the definition for the object, right? Then you create instances of it. So an instance is basically a struct that has data in it, right? All, you, all your properties are in the struct. All of your methods are in the class. The reason that it knows one instance from another instance is that each instance maintains a pointer back to its class. Okay? So, and when you maintain a pointer back to the class, and you make a method call, it can look in the class list and say, oh, I need to jump to this function. So, um, This is very, 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 very old code. Um, basically, what I did is what an object-oriented language does. When you make a method call, it is usually not a direct call. There is an object dispatcher that takes a selector on a class, and it makes the call for you. Okay? So there is a custom tag, CFDO, uh, for data objects that in this case says go to this class, call the new method, and return that structure. And so it is returning a struct with the properties in it for that particular customer. In this case it's empty, so this is a new one, with a link back to a class object. And so I can actually come down here later on and say, um, well, up here you see, I, I said also, go to this class, make a new method, return a form, uh, CFDO, object the form, method process, data the customer. So this object is the struct that created, and so it's going to call the process method on that structure, which is defined in the class. So in effect, if you look at an object, when you work with objects, you usually say x dot call something. This is call um, method on x, passing in x as a parameter. But um, it is, in fact, an object. There are, in fact, methods. There is, in fact, an inheritance tree. I can say that this object derives from another object. If you look at the folder structure for it, for a customer, there might be a method in that folder, a include file called register. So I can say member register, and it will call the registration method for that object, passing in that structure to that include file. Um, if you're interested. <laughs> if you're interested. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But basically, it's either this one little, one little object here. It's either a class method or it's an object method. Um, and everything, and this is very old code, because you, when you were doing shared instances before, you had to lock them to make sure that other people weren't messing with things. Um, but every class is in a folder. All the methods are include files in a folder. It would look in that folder for the specific path. If it didn't find it, it would throw an error. And that sort of told you that you then had to go out and actually try to figure out which folder that method might be in, either in the current folder or in the parents folder or in the parents folder. Once it found it, it stuck it in a cache, so that the next came you, you came through, it would just go and do it instantly. And the same thing for the class definitions. It would do a bit of work the very first time you called something, but after the fact, um, it's sort of like, 
if you actually do the a line trace through it, um, you're not more than like 12 lines of code in the dispatcher at optimum because everything has always, always been done. I've, always, I've called new customer before, I've called registered before, I've called save before, so it knows how to do it. But in effect, that's objects in 